The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask is a game that would seem to be, at first glance, merely an oddball sequel to one of the most highly praised and critically decorated games of all time. But as the years progressed, its popularity gained traction, as fans scrutinized and discussed the game's deep underlying themes and hidden metaphors. As a result, Majora's Mask became something to be remembered all its own, and held in just as high regard by fans as its older, more successful brother, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Now I told myself I wouldn't get lost in the gloomy, brooding, intense atmosphere that is so prevalent in Majora's Mask, but I can't not talk about it. It shines through like a beacon of emotional intensity through every aspect of the game. And while it may have become a bit of a quick and easy go-to for arguing its hyperbolic stance as best Zelda ever, I have to say that it is in fact somewhat justified. But I'm not here to argue the moody, dark, serious setting of Majora's Mask that comes from fan theories such as Is Link Dead? or the Ben Drowned creepypasta. Why? Because that's just it. They're theories made by fans and nothing more. But does that mean the game itself lacks value? On the contrary, I'll be shedding some light on how these theories actually help prove the game's genius by showing how the impact left behind by Majora's Mask was able to inspire fans to craft such wild and intriguing speculation, as well as detailing Link's emotional journey and process along the way. You see, it's in the subtleties of Majora's Mask that make it such a brilliant work of art. Many people seem to argue these days that home console Zelda games have become a bit of a one-trick pony, enforcing linear game design and hand-holdy tutorials into their gameplay mechanics. And although some may argue that with the introduction of Zelda to a three-dimensional setting, so too came with it the linearity, I actually disagree. While Majora's Mask on a surface level may appear to be a fairly traditional Zelda game with regards to its major plotline and gameplay progression, upon closer inspection, you'll see that it approaches linearity in a different way, the way the rest of its approach to game design so masterfully does. The major difference with regards to linearity in Majora's Mask versus a game like The Last of Us is that the former uses its linearity to strengthen character development, whereas the latter lacks the richness of character that is so present in Majora's Mask. Majora's Mask doesn't need a plotline with some unexpected superficial deviation to jolt the player into feeling something. It has such a wealth of atmosphere and richness to its characters that the game is able to move the player without any sort of narrative fluff. With Majora's Mask, Nintendo didn't focus on making a game with a door that is so closed to interpretation, but instead introduced a metric ton of possibilities, most of which are quite dark in nature, yes, but in no way creatively stifled by such. Their very dark undertones made for introspection that felt more intriguing than ever. And while that may have been pushed and praised to the point where it's become obnoxious for some, it still stands that these have made for a captivating and wildly unique approach to the narrative structure of Zelda's history. You look at Skyward Sword, a game panned for its tutorial-ridden, motion-control-heavy approach to game design, but praised for its narrative. And while I agree that it was, for the most part, a pretty engaging story and brought some much-needed personality to certain central characters, I'd argue that it was actually a step backward with regards to approaching The Legend of Zelda from a narrative standpoint. But why is that if the story itself was so engaging and emotionally captivating? People are quick to criticize 3D Zelda games for its approach to linear game design, but is linearity with regards to game structure, getting from point A to point B to point C, etc., as opposed to having the free will to go from point D to point A to point F, etc., really the be-all and end-all to linearity in general? What about linearity with regard to narrative? Majora's Mask had a fairly streamlined plot when you break it down. Link finds himself in a situation where he must visit several temples, defeat the bosses, and use the melodies he learns to summon the four giants capable of stopping the moon from blowing up the realm of Termina, after which he must face the final boss and save the land from evil. But when you take the time to explore all of its various subplots and observe the narrative nuances, you begin to realize that there's a lot more to it than just the black and white outline of the general plot. There are layers and complexities open to interpretation in ways never before seen in any Zelda game prior or since. The game explores themes and subject matter far more mature than anything ever before seen in a Nintendo game, including but not limited to blatant denial in the face of certain doom, immaturity and obsession, hypocrisy, perversion and fraud, the numbing of one's senses to avoid the pain of a sudden and agonizing death, and perhaps most poignant and powerful of all, the expression of true love no matter the cost. I find it simply amazing how many subtle hints they made toward what was actually going on in the story, instead of choosing to paint such a straightforward picture. At the very beginning of the game, the player discovers that the young hero of time left Hyrule on a secret and personal journey, a journey in search of a beloved and invaluable friend, a friend with whom he parted ways when he finally fulfilled his heroic destiny and took his place among legends. At the end of this introduction, a familiar chiming sound is teased, the very same noise made by Link's fairy ally, Navi who is last seen departing from Hyrule at the end of Ocarina of Time. To further edge this theory, the game starts with Link searching the Lost Woods for that unspecified friend, a place close to the home of both he and Navi. But the game never says a word about whether this is truly the case or not. Instead, they ingeniously play off player nostalgia to relay that sense of feedback. 
While the average person playing Majora's Mask with no experience prior to it may not have the same emotional tether as someone who had the chance to experience Ocarina of Time beforehand, they're still able to get a sense of melancholy through that chilling atmosphere that becomes so immediately prevalent upon booting up the game for the first time. But for the player who had played Ocarina of Time beforehand, this opens up an entirely deeper sensation of familiarity, meaning, and longing. It's revealed that Link gave up everything. Zelda, the princess he risked his life to save from the vile clutches of Ganondorf, Hyrule, his home which he also went to great lengths to defend, Saria and the rest of the Kokiri, his family who he grew up with, everything, to go find this one friend. And while most fans likely didn't care much for the nagging fairy from Ocarina of Time, it's hard to argue that there isn't any emotional impact there. We would lend our skills and talents to this mute boy in the game prior, causing us to inevitably develop a certain fondness for him as a character. Not only is Link a model representation of the traditional hero, an archetype which many find appealing, he's also, to a certain extent, a blank canvas for us to become a part of. We embark on this journey together, injecting our sense of individuality into him and filling his voice with our own. It therefore becomes difficult not to lend a sympathetic ear to whatever he may be working toward, even if such a cause may include saving a character as detested as Navi. As a result, the game becomes incredibly personal, further heightening that sense of player immersion and interpretation to the familiar yet unfamiliar setting. And the sequences that play out take you on a journey that would prove more engaging and stimulating on both an emotional and intellectual level than any Zelda game prior or since. But the game takes it even further, deepening the emotive narrative by introducing three more characters with arcs entirely their own, all of which end in tragedy and may very well reflect Link's own personal quest to find Navi. Taking on the role of Link, we would learn to share the blank canvas that was his character with three others, the nameless Deku Scrub, the Goron warrior Dormani, and the Zoran guitarist Mikau. Each character has a tragic backstory, two of which are open to interpretation on varying levels of open-endedness, and every single one of them could symbolize Link's personal growth as a character. The struggles they've faced reflect Link's own in a way that is, again, purely speculative, but ingeniously so. And through Link's ability to mend their tormented souls with the Song of Healing, it could be said that he too lets go a part of his desire on his path to acceptance. The game starts with you taking on the form of a nameless Deku Scrub, the only character with which Link has no direct ties. It's an incredibly haunting sequence and becomes all the more chilling when you encounter what appears to be a disfigured, tortured looking version of yourself. It's difficult to say what exactly happened to him. It's interesting how the character with the least amount of proven backstory can be the most heart wrenching, but when you take into consideration Link being thrown into Termina for the first time, completely clueless as to what's going on, it suddenly starts to make sense that the Deku Scrub isn't given much backstory. It symbolizes the confusion and lack of clarity that is so immediate at the start of the game. And that's just it. This is the power of Majora's Mask. It's able to make you think by not telling you specifically one way or the other how one thing is, and using that lack of clarity to heighten tension and atmosphere. In my opinion, that makes the game far more compelling and enjoyable than a game with a plot as linear as Skyward Swords, where there's so little to interpretation that you almost feel like you're not participating at all, and simply witnessing a series of events play out with little to no personal attachment involved. Later on in the game, you have the option to race the Deku Butler, who says afterward, Actually, when I see you, I am reminded of my son, who left home long ago. Somehow, I feel as if I am once again racing with my son. Once Majora is vanquished and the credits are rolling, the butler is seen mourning the deformed Deku scrub from before, all but confirming its identity as the son, and delivering an emotional impact that is unheard of at the end of most games. You see, the hero of time wasn't able to heal the Deku scrub's soul. Rather, Link's own was healed by the Happy Mask salesman, allowing him to become familiarized with his surroundings, abandoning that fear of the unknown and taking a careful step toward what would become his new future. It reminds you that, although Link may have ultimately succeeded in saving Termina from complete and utter destruction, he wasn't able to save everyone, just as he wasn't able to find that one person he started this quest searching for. Darmani, the Goron warrior beloved by his people, the mountain-dwelling Gorons of Snowhead, who died trying to save his village from a terrible curse. This is particularly sad, taking into consideration that this obviously proud and fearsome warrior died not from a heroic battle, but by simply being blown off a cliff by the invisible Bogoron. A sudden and humiliating death if there ever was one. Having met such an untimely end, Darmani's spirit would linger in torment, unable to be put to rest, watching helplessly as his people met their eventual doom. It can be speculated that Darmani's regret and sorrow for his people in fact reflect Link's own personal remorse regarding Navi. And in the same way Darmani couldn't make it to Snowhead, so too was Link unable to make it to his friend. But just as Darmani is healed, it's possible that Link learns to let go of his shortcomings with Navi. He wasn't able to find her. In essence, he failed in his mission. He may have been able to save the entire land of Hyrule and Princess Zelda along with it, but he couldn't find the one friend who could possibly understand what he'd gone through. He is at peace with his failure, and instead finds a rekindled motivation with his new quest of saving Termina. 
Macau, the Zorn guitarist, who died trying to save the eggs of his speculated romantic interest, Lulu. It's never stated exactly whether these were, essentially, his and Lulu's children, but his drive to the literal brink of death indicates a very likely possibility that such a theory holds water. This makes his death even more pitiable, a to-be father dying and, as a result, failing to rescue his children, leaving his love to remain cursed in a comatose state of apathetic overwhelm until the end of her days. This could also be linked back to the Hero of Time that Link had a love for Navi, in a similar way as Macau may have had a love for Lulu. One could view Lulu's eggs as a metaphorical representation of the inhabitants of Hyrule, with Macau's desperate attempt to rescue the eggs a reflection of Link's perilous struggle to save the world. Both were pushed to the absolute edge, with only one making it out alive, the one who would carry on the other's legacy in the form of a mask. With his new quest nearly complete, Link becomes able to accept the responsibility of saving Termina and its inhabitants, knowing full well that it could ultimately lead to his death, the way Macau did with Lulu's eggs. Link's soul has almost been healed. Through Link and, in effect, us, these three figures are channeled, given a new lease on life, albeit only with regards to completing their task. The Deku scrub raising his father, Darmani saving his village from an endless cold, and Mikau rescuing his possible love interest and children. We are all active participants in what becomes our journey, tethered by the original purpose of finding Navi, and together the four of us work toward a greater good, saving Termina from a terrible fate. And when all is said and done, neither the Deku Scrub, Darmani, or Macau come back to life. But while they may seem to simply live on through the expressionless masks Link uses to defeat Majora, the truth is that they live on through Link's heroic deeds. Without them, Termina would have never been saved. Their loved ones are safe, and so their spirits are healed. Having taken part in Link's emotional and spiritual journey through this fascinatingly complex tale was an absolute treat. Video games are fantastic in that they're an interactive form of entertainment. Linear or not, the player has a direct impact on how the game plays out. No single playthrough is ever exactly the same. But when every once in a while a game like Majora's Mask comes along and creates a following of people theorizing and speculating as to what the various aspects of the narrative could mean, that's when you know you have something truly special. Majora's Mask was such a love letter to fans of the franchise, Ocarina of Time in particular. It's a funny thing to say considering it was literally a direct sequel to that game, and released a mere two years later, the second home console Zelda after Ocarina. But when you strip it down and see just what it has to offer, you suddenly realize, these are characters, songs, and memories that evoke that nostalgic sensation of recalling Ocarina of Time. The game stands wholly as its own unique thing, but uses the groundwork of its groundbreaking predecessor to craft something truly special that yet still manages to evoke that sense of wonder and familiarity from its predecessor. But the game doesn't simply settle for catering to its fans, instead tying that in directly to their overall narrative and injecting further emotional ties into the character of Link. You look around this world of Termina and realize, these are all people Link knows, or thought he knew. But it's like looking into a mirror and seeing a carbon copy of yourself, and suddenly you're not sure what to believe. Nintendo is masterful at providing the player with a powerful sense of nostalgic feedback. They know just who their fans are and how to evoke that sensation better than anyone, but they typically do so in a way that brings on a sense of happiness or joy. With Majora's Mask, however, it uses that sense of nostalgia to bring on something far more complex. You and Link journey through this strange but familiar land of Termina, seeing the faces of people you thought you knew, but are actually entirely different. The game ends with Link and Epona departing Termina, finding themselves back in what appears to be the Lost Woods. Together, they journey on to their next quest, having finally found solace for themselves through the actions of having found solace for others. Although Link had saved Hyrule prior, through his selflessness and acceptance demonstrated in this adventure, he becomes a true hero. And yet, while the game may end, the land saved from evil, the initial objective is never met. Link never finds Navi, but through healing the spirits of those that truly reflect his own underlying motives and emotions, he learns to come to terms with just that. It's such an incredible thing to think on, that Link could learn to find acceptance the way he did. How would you react to everything you knew suddenly thrown into disrepair? What if those people you thought you knew were someone else entirely, and didn't recognize you? You were lost and uncertain, afraid, unsure of what was truly real. That's exactly what Link goes through. In the many themes of Majora's Mask, including but not limited to the five stages of grief represented in each of the main locations of the game, are entirely reflective of that. Majora's Mask superbly conveys that feeling of unease and sense of second-guessing yourself that channels Link's thoughts and emotions so perfectly. He started this quest full of regret, carrying with him the overpowering desire to find that one friend. And he loses her finding himself in a whole other world with familiar faces that do not recognize him, instilling a grief and fear that is so prevalent throughout. And it is because of this unabashed approach to a darker, more subtly complex narrative, coupled with its clever use of catering toward fans of past Zelda games that, for me, truly makes Majora's Mask one of the most captivating, memorable, and enjoyable experiences in a video game to date. 
Through all of this, it continues to inspire generations of Zelda enthusiasts and will likely continue to do so for many more. It is undoubtedly a timeless work of art, as evidenced by the fascinating theories and deep speculation by its many inspired fans. For a game to bring that out of someone? To make them want to dive into its richly complex and magnificent world, scrutinizing its characters and contributing to the narrative in ways that generate even further significance and wonder, ceaselessly instilling life into what has consequently become a genuine classic? Well, to have accomplished all of that, I'd have to say that The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask truly is one of gaming's greatest.